Hi. Welcome to this DCMI virtual tutorial session on the IIIF. Uh, you, you're probably all familiar with that international image interoperability framework. And after the presentation, you can post questions in the chat. So let's start with the tutorial, this uh, introduction to IIIF. Our speaker is Glenn Robson, who has worked as the IIIF technical coordinator and has been giving um, assistance and uh, tutorials all over the world. And so let me also uh, <clears throat> maybe give Glenn a chance to introduce himself because he has his own experiences in the National Library of Wales and was involved in making the digitized the collections of maps, manuscripts, photographs, and newspapers available through IIIF. So let's expect a great tutorial today. Okay, Glenn, your turn. Thank you, and thank you for the, the lovely introduction. And I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you today about um, IIIF. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to pause uh, through the presentation for questions, um, so do please uh, ask them in the chat and I'll try and give you notice when uh, these pauses are coming up. Um, so I'm going to start with just a bit about myself, although a lot of this has been covered. Um, so I'm the, the IIIF Technical Coordinator uh, and I work for the uh, IIIF Consortium, which is a, a group of institutions which kind of fund the support and the development of the IIIF standards. And my main role is to help with implementations, uh, work with vendors to help them support IIIF. Uh, I run training sessions a bit like this and also uh, a week long uh, training session that we've got coming up next week. Uh, and I'm also just a general community resource to help the community keep going with the IIIF standards and support the different groups which are working and looking at different aspects of IIIF. And um, before that, uh, as mentioned, I used to work at the National Library of Wales and I'll be talking about some of the projects that I worked on. Um, but they did a lot of digitization there. Uh, they had a large newspaper collection uh, and also did some exciting things with crowdsourcing and link data. Um, and I kind of first uh, cut my teeth on IIIF really was, was that National Library Wales and implementing IIIF um, for them. Uh, so I'll cover that. Um, this is what I'm planning to talk about today. Um, so I think we've got about an hour and a half um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, just a bit of background about why IIIF is important and what it can provide and then go through the different APIs available at the moment, the image, presentation, search, and authentication. Uh, and then JSON-LD and linked data. Uh, I know there's been lots of presentations about linked data in this conference, so I'm gonna link it to that. Um, talk about some of the most exciting aspects of IIIF, um, which is IIIF and annotations. And then talk about the future. So uh, one of the exciting areas that they're looking into is discovery of IIIF resources. Uh, and then I'll, end with uh, further resources. So if you want more detail, uh, where can you go and, and how you can join the community. As I'm talking, uh, I'm going to be using a lot of uh, material that's available on, the pub on, on live for you to uh, experience as I'm talking. And I'm just going to paste this link here uh, into the chat. Um, if you go to that link, you should be taken to a GitHub repo and all of the links I talk about should be on that page. Uh, and if not, just, just let me know and I can uh, add them to that page if they're missing. Uh, for some of the um, examples that I'm going to be giving, we're going to be looking at some IIIF resources. Uh, and for that, you need a JSON view plugin. Um, and they can be downloaded for Chrome and Firefox. So you might want to do that uh, as I'm speaking. So to start, I'm going to go through um, what IIIF is and what the kind of benefits are. And probably the easiest way to start, talk about IIIF um, is to talk about the uh, acronym. Um, so it's International Image Interoperability Framework. And as you've heard, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful. So um, people tend to call it IIIF. Um, international, uh, it started much like um, how um, we heard that Dublin Core started from Stuart Weeble yesterday. Um, it has been international from the beginning. Um, we also had meetings um, in North America and Europe. Uh, and more recently, we've had more um, meetings around the world, including Asia and South America. Um, so we tried to really be international from the beginning. And just looking at the map of implementations, uh, on this map, this is available on the IIIF website. And if, 
If you know of AAAF implementations that aren't listed, um, please do get in contact and we'll, we'll add them to the map. Uh, the ones in blue and red are um, AAAF consortium members, so they're people that um, are members and they pay for the, the support and um, development of AAAF. And then the ones in yellow are the uh, implementers of AAAF, and you can see we've got a really good coverage. Uh, and this is increasing every year. And I noticed there was a presentation yesterday um, about some work um, going on in Taiwan uh, with AAAF, so that's another pin that we'll have to add. Uh, and as I say, if you, if you do know of AAAF uh, instances, uh, we're really keen to hear about them and, and add them to the map. Um, but you can see it's got a real uh, global reach. The second I in AAAF stands for image, um, which now that AAAF supports audiovisual uh, was a bit of a mistake. Um, but at the time when AAAF first started, um, it was for images. Uh, and there are many types of images. Um, AAAF really started out in the manuscript community. Um, but nowadays, you just as likely see manuscripts as you are artworks or museum objects or newspaper images. And um, there's a real mix. And as I say, um, with audiovisual now supported, um, I is potentially less important than it was, um, but it's really too late for us to change. So the second I is I, but think of image and audiovisual when you see that. The third I is interoperable. Uh, and this is a bit more difficult to define. Um, but interoperable really means is that you can take your content and you can view it in different uh, tools and you can use it in different tools. And um, this particular example um, is Mirador on the left hand side and it's a manuscript from National Library of Wales um, shown in, in Mirador on the left hand side and then shown in the Universal Viewer on the right hand side. Um, this might occur if say the institution, say the National Library of Wales, uh, want to make their uh, manuscripts available to the public and they might choose to do the universal viewer but then a researcher might want to start annotating the manuscript and so they take the manifest from the universal viewer and open it in Mirador and they might be able to start annotating and start analyzing the content and um, so because AAAF is a standard it is interoperable between viewers but there's also um, kind of a deeper level of interoperability is with images um, this is an example where um, it's a manuscript that was owned by Otto Edge um, in the earliest 20th century. Uh, and what he did is he, he cut the leaves apart and sold them to different institutions in the US. Uh, and this project uh, brings it all together through AAAF. So each of the individual leaves which were digitized in the separate institutions or are made available over AAAF can be brought together uh, into a, a manifest and a manuscript. And if you go to the project Mirador site, you'll be able to see this uh, manifest and be able to browse it. And it appears like any other AAAF manifest, you don't realize, but underneath um, the, the actual images are coming from different collections and being brought together uh, to be reunited digitally where they are separate um, in physical form. And this is another example of interoperable uh, collections. Um, so this example is uh, in Mirador again. Um, and it's the Chaucer Canterbury Tales uh, manuscripts. And there's two copies of them available, one in the Huntington Library in Los Angeles uh, and one in the National Library of Wales. Uh, and there's a great uh, blog in that link at the bottom uh, from Ben Alberton, where he talks about the difficulty um, in the past where researchers had to deal with different methods of delivering images uh, to users. Um, but with AAAF, you can bring these two manifests into a single viewer and do side-by-side -side comparis comparison and annotation. Uh, and it's a really powerful use case for the interoperability of AAAF. And finally, the F, the framework. Um, so this is really uh, a standard, and it means that um, we've, the AAAF community, have published a standard of how to interact with images and um, presentation API manifests. Um, and because we produce that standard, uh, institutions can publish it in a standard way and viewers and tools can consume it in a standard way. Um, and so because of those standards, it means that we can have this interoperability. Um, there are two main standards, the kind of the core standards of AAAF. And these are the first standards that were developed. It's the image API and the presentation API. Uh, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail on both of these. Um, but the image API is all about getting the pixels, kind of getting the image uh, in different ways. And then the presentation API is at a higher kind of level where you might bring multiple images together in a presentation API manifest. 
So I'll start with the image API and after I've done this section, I'll pause for questions. I can see there's some questions, so I'll, I'll cover those. Um, so the image API uh, is all about getting access to an image and portions of an image. Uh, and the way this works is we have um, the standard which is published at there. Uh, this links to 2.1, but 3.0 um, was released uh, a couple of months ago. So I should update this link. Um, but there are very, it's very similar between two and three. Uh, and what AAA have to find is this right-hand side of the URL. Uh, the left-hand side is the identifier. Um, and in this example, uh, we've asked for a region. Um, so this is a source image here. Uh, and we're asking for a region, which is 80 pixels from the left, 15 pixels from the top. And that's our kind of starting point. And then we're going to ask for a rectangle, which is 60 pixels wide and 75 pixels high. So that's our region of our image, which we've got here. Then we're going to ask for the size, which is 80% of the original size. We're then going to ask for rotating it by 345 degrees. We're changing the quality to a grayscale, and then we're asking for JPEG. I mentioned the training, um, and um, that it is available next week, and there is uh, some spaces available. Um, but all of the training material is available um, for free. The training um, costs, but the, um, the material is free. And so if you navigate to this page, um, you'll see uh, we've built a kind of interactive viewer, which kind of explains um, how the image API works. And if I just go through uh, more detail in the different stages. So the first part is the identifier. Um, and this is the identifier which uniquely references each particular image. And IIIF doesn't really say much about this, apart from it needs to be unique. And preferably, it should be under HTTPS um, to allow it to be used most widely in different tools. Um, but if you click on this and you'll see a drop down and you'll be able to select the different identifiers um, to change their underlying images. And we've got an example here from Harvard, uh, from the Welcome Collection and also from Smithsonian. The next one is the uh, region of the image. Um, so we've got some predefined ones here. So the, the one I've selected is 2000 pixels from the left, 3000 pixels from the top and it's got a width of 2,000 and a height of 2,000 pixels. Uh, and you can see it's um, kind of zoomed in um, to the statue, the book of the statue. We also have some predefined ones like full, which just means I want the full region of the image, the full image without uh, any part, part of it. And the square, which will do the best efforts to turn a rectangular image into a square. It won't stretch it, but it will just try and pick out the best region uh, which fits in that square, which can be useful for thumbnails. Uh, then rotation, which is, is pretty self-explanatory. You just um, give it a rotation, it will rotate the image. Um, there's also mirroring, so you can flip the image uh, using a special um, exclamation mark uh, in the URL. And then the quality. Uh, and this is, this is not really kind of the size of the image. This is, um, we've predefined a number of qualities. Um, so default, which is whatever it's scanned in. Uh, bitonal, so just pure black or white or grayscale. Uh, or color, uh, and you can select these different ones. And then finally, um, we have the format, uh, and this is the image format that you uh, want to select, and it could be JPEG, PNG, TIFF, GIF, or in this example, WebP. Um, as you're kind of fiddling with the URL, you'll notice that this URL changes. Um, and this URL here is always the full URL to the image. So if you copy this image into a new tab, um, you'll see the image that you've created. Uh, and this is one of the real powerful features of AAAF is that however you've ma manipulated the image, you've always got this static, stable, persistent URL, um, which you could then use in a blog post, in an academic article, um, or as a, a, a tweet. Um, you've always got this kind of URL which you can build uh, to access the, in the part of the image that you're interested in. And then the final part of the um, IIIF image API is this info.json. Um, this has got a special location. So everything to the left of the info.json is part of the identifier. And the info.json is a JSON file which gives uh, viewers um, information ab about the, what the image server supports and how big the image and uh, what sort of tiles they can request. So you can see in this example, um, we've got the formats down at the profile. So this one only supports uh, a JPEG. It doesn't support the other formats and JPEG is the minimum. Uh, in qualities, we've got native color and grayscale. Uh, and then up at the top, we've got dimensions. So the width and height of the full image. 
uh, and then we've got some information about the tiles which I'll speak to about in a sec um, but this is the information that a viewer requires um, if it's going to understand it and be able to display it as a zoomable image and just as a slight aside um, although IIIF and many of the IIIF image servers support any type of source image um, the vast majority of um, IIIF implementers have chosen JPEG 2000 or Pyramid TIFF. And the reason for this is related to how Zoom works. And if you think of Google Maps, this happens in the same way. Um, to give access to a large image, you only really want to send the parts of the image that the user is looking at. In this slide, the red square is the user's viewport. You can see the red square there is what the user is looking at. Um, as you're zoomed out, your viewport is the entire image. So in this version, you're actually looking at the whole image as you're zooming out. And as you zoom in, your viewport is a smaller portion of the image. And you can see in the um, bottom two uh, versions of this image, we've got um, little squares uh, which make up the big image. And these are known as tiles. And you can see as you're zooming into the second level, you're only seeing a portion of the image. So the tiles, uh, only the tiles that are in your viewport are sent to the um, viewer. And so all of these other tiles are kept on the server until you actually look at them. And this means it can be a really efficient um, zooming experience and that you're not sending the very, very high quality image to the user if they're only looking at a thumbnail. You're only sending the portion of the image that they're actually looking at. Looking at. And the advantage of JPEG 2000 and Pyramid TIFF is that these four levels um, here, these one, two, three, four levels, and all of these different tiles are all stored inside the same image. It's the, if you look inside the image file, you'll see these different uh, levels and also all of the different tiles. And in particular, JPEG 2000 is structured so that if you want to thumbnail the top level, um, you look at the start of the uh, JPEG 2000 file and you'll be able to find it there. So you don't need to download the whole file. So although IIIF is kind of agnostic to the source image format, um, as I say, for performance reasons, the vast majority of people use JPEG 2000 or Pyramid TIFF. And then when this all comes together, um, if you click on that link, you'll see a zoomable version of this image here. Um, and you can zoom in, zoom out, and it will calculate which tiles you need um, as you're zooming around. Another example of um, this use of tiles, and uh, this is from Mike Appleby, um, who is at Yale, U Yale University. Uh, and it, show, it mixes up the different tiles of an image uh, and gives you a kind of a game to play, um, which you can move the tiles to kind of rebuild the uh, original image. And I, I realize now that I've shown you this, I've probably lost you for the rest of the presentation, but um, the link is, is there and is also in the list of links uh, that I provided earlier. So, I'll pause after the slide for questions, um, but I've gone into how the IIIF image API works. And luckily this really is the, the easiest one um, to implement. And the reason for that is there are many um, IIIF image servers that are open source and free, um, which you can download and install. And once you have that configured, you can load images into it, and then you have access to the IIIF image API. Um, some of the main ones are Cantaloupe, IIP and, and Loris. Um, those three in particular seem to be the most well used in the community um, and they are very much similar features across them and performance wise. Um, so it's generally a question of um, which, which fits better into your infrastructure. Um, potentially if you're a Linux based institution you might enjoy IIP. Um, if you have Python developers you might choose Loris and again if you have Java developers you might prefer Cantaloupe. Um, but the functionality is very similar and, and performance wise they're also very similar. So once you have your image server, then um, you have a viewer and there are a number of just image API viewers. So OpenC Dragon, Leaflet, IAP Viewer are three examples. Um, but to get the more complicated, uh, kind of more higher level um, viewers, uh, you might look at the um, Universal Viewer, Mirador or Diva. Um, and I've shown examples of Universal Viewer and Mirador. Um, but for those, you need the presentation API, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, but just with the image API, you can embed OpenC Dragon Leaflet or IAP Viewer into your website uh, and you'll have zoomable images. Uh, and there's a full list of, of IIIF compatible software at the awesome uh, IIIF list at the bottom. Um, so one way to do it is to install your own image server. Another way is um, there are commercial companies that offer hosting of IIIF images uh, and there are a number available. 
and there are also digital asset management systems, commercial ones, which support AAAF. Um, so maybe have a look about where your images are stored currently uh, and see if that system supports images uh, and maybe not contact them and see if they will support it for you. So I'll, I'll pause here. Um, so far I've covered examples of IIIF and also gone into the details of the image API. Uh, the next section I'll move on to the presenta presentation API uh, before moving on to annotations. So do you have the bit.ly URL in the chat? Yes, you do, great. Yes. Any questions? Any questions? No. Any question from the audience? You can raise your hand or type in the chat. Well, Glenn, you mentioned the, the supported from different servers and the tools. Yeah, I think uh, many of our audience are in the metadata community and they may be using the content DM, uh, which also fully support IIIF, right? Yeah, that's right. That's one of um, the great examples really of, um, mm -hmm. of a, a DAM system, a content management system that supports IIIF. So yes. Um, OCLC and, and Content DM uh, does support the IIIF, both the presentation and the image API. Um, so yeah, that's that's a good example. Nope. So there's a question about, can I post the links in the chat? Um, so I, I can definitely share my presentation after this, but I hope all of the links um, should be in there in the um, link that is in the chat, the uh, DCMI links. Uh, and if there is missing ones, um, do put them in the chat and I'll, I'll make sure they're added afterwards. Yeah. Great. So I'll, I'll move on if that's okay. And then um, there's another few pauses, so I can wait. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Great. So the next uh, part of it is the, the presentation API. Um, so this is kind of once you've set up your image server, um, this is the next thing to look at. And this is where you bring multiple images together and add structure and metadata. Uh, and you can see the full structure at the URL and the full specification at the URL. But it includes things like basic descriptive information, uh, what the item is, who created it, um, rights information. So um, in version three, we, su we suggest using rights.org um, URIs or Creative Commons URIs. Um, links to structured metadata um, and links to other content, uh, sequences of images, uh, table of contents, and underpinning it all, although it's, it's not very explicit, but it is there, is that it's all underpinned by a linked data vocabulary called shared canvas model, um, which I will cover a bit later. So when you look at a IIIF asset like this, this is looking at a, a manuscript in Mirador, um, the image itself, um, the Zoomable images, um, that comes from the image API. And these thumbnails at the bottom are also from the image API. But the bits in red is what comes from the presentation API. Um, so we've got the label at the top, we've got the table of contents, and we've got the sequence of images, the order of the images um, that come from the presentation API. And what the presentation API defines is this uh, JSON-LD structure called a manifest. Uh, and this is kind of the unit, um, the lowest unit. It's the unit that you look in a viewer. Um, so you can think of a, a manuscript, a newspaper issue, an artwork. Um, it's kind of that sort of level, the physical kind of handling unit is a manifest. And in here we have things like the label, which says the Welsh Book of Remembrance. Uh, we have a, a service which links to the IIIF search API, which I'll talk about later. Uh, we have the metadata section, which I'll also talk about next. Uh, we have description, a license, which is a URI, and in version three, there should be a um, rights.org or a Creative Commons um, URI. We have a logo, attribution, sequences, which is the order of the images that should be shown, structures, which is the table of contents. Now, when I, I talk about metadata, um, this is 
probably a different kind of metadata that you're used to. Um, AAAF defines metadata as uh, metadata for the user rather than metadata for machines. So when you look at a AAAF manifest, you see that um, we have a label and we have a value. So the label is a date and the value in this particular time is 1888. Um, and you can see how this uh, is shown in a viewer. Um, these aren't meant to be human readable, uh, sorry, to be machine readable. Um, we don't have URIs and we don't, the AAAS specification doesn't say you need these meta field, metadata fields. It's left completely open to the institution that publishes their manifest. And it's only intended um, for the user to be able to know what they're looking at. Um, we have other ways of, of linking to structured metadata, which I'll talk about later. But this metadata section is, is just for the user. It's not meant to be um, something that can be machine processable, processable. But saying that, it does support multilingual um, values. Uh, and this is an example from the National Library of Wales where the, the keys are translated, but the content isn't. Um, so for this example, um, the key is author uh, and Welsh it's Audia. Uh, and then we've got the same value for both because they haven't translated the source data, um, but the keys are. And if you have a look at the, the universe review, when you select the, select the Welsh interface, um, you'll see the Welsh coming through. And any combination of the source metadata or the, um, the keys can be translated. And just really to highlight this again, that um, the metadata section is for humans, not for machines. Um, we don't have URIs for fields uh, and there are no cross standards of metadata between institutions. The encouraged way to link to structure metadata is to use a specialist see also field, which can be linked to other metadata, metadata standards like Dublin Core, EDM, MARC, or CDOC CRM. The reason for this is the AAAF community didn't want to reinvent the wheel with so many other metadata standards available to choose from. It's also liberating to just concentrate on what makes sense to the user, uh, rather than having to funnel very rich metadata down a narrow pipe. So this metadata section is just for the user and then it's possible to link to richer um, machine processable processing uh, metadata by using the see also link. Um, I mentioned the license logo and attribution and this uh, is how it's shown in the viewer. So the license is here, the URI, URI is shown. Um, as I say in version three, there's a more controlled list. Um, and so future viewers will be able to um, show a, an icon rather than this URI uh, in viewers. Uh, but in version two, it was, it was more open. Uh, in logo, um, you can see an example of a, a logo. This can be a IIIF image, so it could be resized and fit uh, into the viewer. And then we have the attribution, um, which is, this example is the Welsh Centre for International Affairs. Um, this is a way that IIIF kind of does its structured metadata that has specific fields for them. Um, and they're only present if they kind of drive the viewing experience. Um, and in particular attribution, uh, one of the rules says that uh, if attribution is present, it has to be shown in the viewer um, to make sure that um, the license and any kind of restrictions are available to a user. And next I'll go into um, structures. So this is a kind of a table of contents. Uh, in this example, um, it's a, uh, the Welsh Book of Remembrance. It was created um, after the end of World War I to commemorate everyone that um, died from Wales uh, during World War I. And it's ordered by um, the different branch uh, of the military and then inside there, uh, every regiment. Um, so it's got kind of three or four or five different levels of um, hierarchy. Um, and this can be um, showed in, um, in the table of contents using the structures and range um, expression. And then sequences. So this is just the kind of the list of pages. Um, so there's, there's only one order for this manuscript. So there's only one sequence. Um, but some manuscripts have different orders uh, and different ways of viewing it. And so there are, it is possible to have multiple se sequences and to be able to navigate these images uh, in different orders. Um, one of the main principles of um, IIIF is this uh, canvas idea. And this can be thought of as equivalent of a, a page of a book or maybe um, the source of an image. Um, it can also be thought of as a PowerPoint slide. So within a manifest, you have sequences and within sequences, you have canvases and it's one canvas per page is how you think of it. Um, so we have this uh, canvas, which has a width and a height and we can paint things onto it. Um, just like, as I said, a PowerPoint slide. 
And in this example, we're pointing, we're painting a, um, this artwork from uh, the Welcome Collection onto the canvas. And we're saying that the canvas width and the image width are the same and the canvas height and the image height are the same. And so this image is, is on top of the canvas and it's covering the canvas. Another alternative is this, where we have two images which are painted onto the same canvas. Um, so again, the same width and height. Um, so we're painting on uh, the source digitized images, image, and we're also painting on an X-ray of the same image. And then we're giving users a choice um, about which one they want to display. Um, and this is a great example from Tom Crane where he brings these together in a, in a slider. And so if you go to this link, um, you'll be able to drag the slider and back and forth um, to see the digitized version compared to the X-rayed version. Uh, and one interesting thing is that when this was originally painted, um, there was obviously a, a line of skulls around um, John D um, that were painted over in, in later versions of the painting. Um, so you can't see the skulls in, in this version, but when you scroll it back to the X-ray, um, you can see them just there and they go all the way around. Um, so you can show some really interesting things um, by combining these different ways of looking at images. Um, this is another example where um, from uh, the BNF, the National Library of France, um, here they've painted the image of the, of the manuscript onto the canvas and then the illustration has been painted um, to a particular region of the canvas, this square here. Uh, and the reason that they've done this is that the two images are actually located in two different places in Paris. Um, so this, the manuscript is from the BNF and the um, illustrations were cut out um, many years ago and, and are in a different institution which has a different uh, IIIF image API endpoint. And both of these images are being combined in a single canvas uh, and the illustration is being overlaid onto the original source image. And you can see it here live on their, on their website and you can click this link here, um, which either shows the miniature or, or takes it away. Um, but you can zoom both and actually you can zoom higher into the illustration because it's been digitized at a higher detail than the, the overall manuscript. And this is a more complicated example. Um, this is from the Yale Center of British Art uh, and this is a conservation image. Um, so they've taken lots of different versions, image versions of this painting. And um, I think this is a UV image, they've got an X-ray image, uh, they've got the source image. And then for bits that they want to do conservation on, so for example, this figure here, um, they take very, very high quality uh, images of this and overlay it um, so that they can see the effects of their conservation. So they'll do a before and after. Uh, and you can zoom in um, into this, even though it's maybe high more high quality than the rest of the image, you can still zoom further in. And then the left-hand side of Mirador, you can kind of turn off these different layers um, so you can have a look at, uh, really in detail uh, into this image. So as well as painting images uh, onto canvas, you can also paint text. Um, so this is an example of a, a newspaper where the newspaper is painted onto the canvas, um, but also this JSON uh, annotations can also be pointed onto the canvas. Um, and you can see this um, top example here uh, this is a, an annotation. It's painted on this particular canvas, which is this ID here, with this box. And it's saying that the word two is um, in this position of the canvas. And this can be shown in Mirador, like this. Um, so once you open up this, this manifest, which has got both the image and the annotation list painted on the canvas, um, it does all these boxes. Um, and if you put your mouse over a box, it will show you the word underneath that. Um, so you can see it's got public and it's um, shown public. And this is data that's been generated by uh, an OCR process. It's automatically turned these, um, this image into words and then it's linked, uh, converted into IIIF annotations and linked from the manifest. So, so far I've talked about images, um, but now with version three, this is also possible uh, with audio visual. And the way this has been achieved is by adding a duration to a canvas. So as well as the canvas width and the canvas height, um, we also have a duration. And in this example, we have um, from zero seconds to 10 seconds is the duration of the canvas. And first of all, I'm gonna paint this image on the full width and height of the canvas. Uh, and I'm gonna make it show for the full duration. 
And then I'm going to add this video and I'm going to put it into this area of the canvas, much like the, the BNF example. Um, but I'm going to put a video in this area and I'm going to say I want it to display from second four to second seven. Um, and if you go to this URL, you'll see all this example working. Um, you can see as it starts, you've got the picture of the bonfire. Uh, and then after four seconds, you'll see the video playing. Um, you also see some text appearing uh, for another time period. Uh, and then also another video um, displayed on this, um, displayed over here. And you can see this, this is the canvas and it's been kind of painted with spatial things and also uh, things at particular time. Uh, enables you to make this really kind of complicated and rich presentation. I've got this video, um, which I'll show in a second, but this is a kind of a more complete example of, of what's possible. Um, so this example, um, they have uh, the canvas is, is this kind of whole screen. Uh, on the left hand side, they've got a video uh, of someone playing the piano. And on the right hand side, they've got an image of the, um, of the score. And as she's playing on the piano, the parts of the score that she's playing is being highlighted. And you can see that this is done as a canvas uh, with the video of the full um, time period. And then the annotations are done at specific time periods as they're playing. Um, so I'll just let this play. And hopefully the sound will come through. You heard that. So I'll pause again for questions. Um, I've covered the manifest range sequence and canvases of the presentation API. Next, I'm going to move on to collections and then talk about annotations and uh, some of the linked data parts of it. Any question, Green? About Any question from uh, for the second API, the presentation API? Uh, Marsha, there is one question in the um, chat channel. Yeah, but that was about uh, language metadata uh, table that enrich the interoperability. The well, maybe I can answer it with, with the metadata to the side, because I, I did mention that it's possible to have multilinguals, uh, multilingual metadata. And um, there is a standard for how we tag those. Um, I can't offhand remember what it is. It might be that one, or it might be another one. Um, but there is a list of, um, I, on, if you go to the AAA presentation API, there's a defined way of saying if it's uh, English or, or um, French or Welsh. Um, and I'll be in the specification. Uh, yeah, so Karen has a question about the, can you go back to the, the unbound manuscript page example? Whether that is uh, handled as a collection? So the, well, the question is more on um, whether handle as a collection or? Was it this one? I think it might be this one where um, each of the individual leaves are from separate institutions. Um, so no, that is a manifest. Um, I'll go on to collections uh, on the next slides, but this particular one is a manifest. Um, and it, you get a better experience, I'd say, um, because this really should be a physical item, which is all together. Um, it probably fits better as a, as a manifest rather than a collection. Um, but this is kind of an individual choice and you'll see in the next few slides about what um, the collections look like. Um, but uh, I think this is probably a, a better idea of a, of a manifest, but there is some kind of choice on, on how you model, model your data. Um, so it's a single manifest that points to individual images at different locations. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, so within the canvas, you say what your um, image API, where your image API is. Um, and in this example, the image API happens to be at different institutions. Um, and that's how that works. But 
you know, it can be at the same institution, but it can also be at different ones. Karen, you can talk. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, can you just talk about where that, uh, where those pointers are in the manifest? I was trying to imagine it, and I, does it, it goes in the canvas? It goes in the canvas, yeah. Um, so I haven't actually shown the JSON for this. Um, so the, the closest bit, I've kind of hidden the JSON for this, but <laughs> if you imagine this as a canvas, uh, inside here it has a service element. And inside the service element, you give the ID of the IIIF image API endpoint. Um, so the so uh, so it's a sorry. So it's a seek is so the manifest has a sequence. So each page is in the sequence. Yes. And then the canvas for each page points to the yeah. to its home. Yeah. So I, I do have the JSON here actually. So this is a sequence. Oh. Um, so in here you have the canvas um, and inside the canvas you have the service and here you have the ID HTTP dams lgc.org triple f 2.0 image 464023 and that's the identifier for the image API um, and this one happens to be at the National Library of Wales but this potentially could be anywhere. Uh, so um, so sorry if this is a basic but um, uh, so every time I have a manifest, I have a sequence that has the sort of canvas within it. Yes. So even if I just have one image, I just have a simple sequence where I just have that one, one thing in my sequence and that would point to my image. Yes, that's it. Yeah, okay. so you'd have a single canvas. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the question. You can see the model of the whole model, the hierarchy, that is very clear for the presentation API. Great. There's also a question, I think, about um, options to display captions for audio and video. And um, I haven't shown that, but yes, yes, it is possible um, to have uh, captions. There are, you can do it in two ways. You can have um, captions which are painted onto the video and um, so they're always there a bit like when you see them burned in and um, you can paint them onto the image um, but you can also have them referenced um, so that your user can decide if they want to choose them turn them on or off um, but you can have captions um, and they can be in, in multi-language um, triple f says that they should be in annotations um, but using that see also mechanism you can also link to other formats um, so I know there are many formats for uh, captions uh, and you can link to the C also. And then some viewers will, will support those annotations, um, but all should support uh, annot annotations. Thank you. Yeah, this model we need to really study. <laughs> Um, this question about accessibility. Um, so th this is probably the best time to ask actually. Um, so there have been accessibility investigations into um, particularly Mirador and the Universal Viewer. And um, if you join the IIIF Slack channel, I'm sure they'll be able to share, you, share the results with you. Um, it is difficult because they are um, very graphical material, um, but as far as they can, I believe they are uh, accessible. Um, but if you go to the uh, the very last slide, I've got a link to join the um, Triple R Slack channel. Um, and if you ask in in there, I'm sure they'll be able to share you the uh, investigations they've undertaken. And I think, as as mentioned, um, the audio um, captions and subtitles could be really helpful for accessibility. Uh, and they can be displayed through Triple F. Okay. Very good discussions. Shall I move on? Okay. So on this slide, I've, as I mentioned, I covered manifests, um, which contain ranges, which is table of contents, sequences, which is a collection of images, 
and then we have that canvas uh, which has images. And uh, next I'm going to cover is uh, collections. Um, so they're at a higher level uh, than a manifest. And collections can be really useful uh, for this example of uh, newspapers and journals. Um, the manifest would be at the uh, newspaper issue level, um, but the collection would be at the newspaper title or volume level. Um, and you can collate these uh, newspapers together using this uh, manifest at the bottom level and collection at the top level. Uh, and if you have a look uh, at this in, say, the Universal Viewer, um, there's two ways to navigate this hierarchy, either by date um, or by the, the label of the um, newspaper issue. And the date um, works because there's a special field in IIIF called nav date, uh, which you can give a proper ISO date um, to say where you want it to appear uh, in the structure. Um, collections can also be really useful for um, archives. So this is a, another example from National Library of Wales, um, which is an archival collection of World War, War, World War I tribunal records. Um, and this has, I think, seven levels of hierarchy. Um, the bottom level, the kind of file or item level, is where you have the manifest. And then all the levels above that are collections of collections or collections of manifests. Uh, and you can kind of reference this rich hierarchy um, through IIIF. And if you have a look in the viewer, um, you can see the um, hierarchy here and it allows you to navigate. And one thing you'll notice is um, this kind of view of the object is very similar to a table of contents. Um, so this is what I was mentioning with, with Karen, that it's a bit of um, interpretation about how you model things as manifests and as collections. Um, we've got kind of some rules about say newspapers and, and archives, um, but generally this kind of modeling decision is, is left um, for the institution to decide. And there are some benefits to having lots of manifests in the collection, some benefits for having a big manifest uh, with fewer collections. So it kind of depends on your um, use case. I tend to think that if it's a physical thing that you can pick up and take around, then it should be a manifest. Um, and if it's a collection of those things, it should be a collection. Um, but there's not really a hard and fast rule on that. Um, another use case of collections is uh, on the fly collections. Um, this is an example from the Bodleian Library, which um, gives access to collections for search results. Uh, so in this example, I've searched for map. Uh, and it's given me a IIIF collection as a, as a result. Uh, and then I can open this up in um, the Universal Viewer and I can navigate through my different search results, um, which is really quite powerful. Um, not a lot of institutions do this, but it, it, is, it can be very useful um, to kind of take your search results and then load them into your own viewer, uh, potentially start organizing or annotating them. So that's collections. I'm going to move on now to um, the IIIF search API. And this is uh, another one of the, the IIIF uh, APIs. Um, the order that I've covered them is really the kind of the order that we, we suggest you implement them. So start with the image API and move on to the presentation API. And then once you've got that working, have a look at the search and auth APIs. Um, the search API allows you to search within a manifest. It only allows searching annotations. It doesn't support searching the metadata. Uh, and you can't search across manifests. It's only meant to search within. Uh, it does support autocomplete. So when you start typing, it will suggest a word for you um, to search for. And it's based on um, something called W3C annotations, which is a standard way of doing annotations. Um, the version of the IIIF search API that's available at the moment was, is um, tied to a previous version of the W3C annotations called Open Annotations. And we are looking at creating a new version of the search API now that um, IIIF version 3 has released uh, to bring it up to date with web annotations. Um, so currently, you'll notice some things, and I'll point them out, um, that are slightly different between um, the Open Annotations and the web annotations. Um, but as I say, we are hoping to release a new version of the search API um, that will support uh, web annotations. Um, so an annotation, um, I've talked about these briefly, but uh, this is what it looks like. So the, the W3C annotation model has three classes. Uh, it has an annotation, which in this example has an identifier 
a type uh, and a motivation painting. And then it has a body and a target. The target is where the annotation is pointing to and the body is a content of the annotation. Uh, and because this is um, open annotations rather than W3C annotations, uh, it's called a resource instead of body and on instead of target. Uh, and these are the tweaks that we, we hope to make in the next version. Um, so in this particular example, um, we have the target, which is this canvas ID, which is within your manifest, and then this box um, left, uh, left, the amount of pixels from the left, amount of pixels from the top, and then the width and the height of the box you're annotating. And then the, the content of that box, um, I put Bob Smith. Um, so this could be a transcription, this could be a comment, uh, and you can kind of alternate your motivation depending on, on what you're trying to say with your annotation. And this is an example of a, of a search service. So if you go to that, if you follow that link, you'll go to a manifest which is held at the uh, North Carolina State University. And if you look down at the service section, um, you'll see it has a link um, to the search service. It also has a profile to tell you which version of the search service it is uh, and a label for displaying to the user. And then it's also got a second service in here, which is the auto suggest or to complete. So when you start typing, it will suggest um, searches that will return results. And then this is a response that you'll get um, if you go to the search service and you search for warrior. Um, and you can see down in the resources section, uh, it's returning annotations and it's returning open annotations uh, that we saw earlier. Um, this is an example of what you'll see if you go to the um, auto suggest. Um, if you type in war, it will uh, suggest warrior as a good match for you to search in. And then if we flip to the universal viewer, um, this is what it looks like in practice. So I've started typing war and it suggests warrior and I click that and then it shows me all the instances of warrior that are in the manifest. And it's kind of highlighted them. And then these bubbles at the bottom are to tell you which page um, the results are on. Um, so this is a newspaper and there are only four pages and it said there's results on one which I'm looking at at the moment and there's results on page three and I'll click that and it'll show me the, the highlighted um, ones of those. So next the authentication API. Um, so the, the authentication API uh, controls access to TripLife resources. It doesn't restrict you to which authentication system you want to use so it can work with OAuth or CAS or any authentication system you already have, um, but it provides an interaction pattern to allow both internal and external viewers to authenticate um, to know if a user can access a resource securely. It handles the following use cases, uh, login uh, with username and password, uh, click through, so a user is asked to agree to terms and conditions before they're able to view the content, uh, kiosk authentication, so you might want to do this if you're running an exhibition uh, and you want to provide a kiosk that has protected access to certain material. Uh, and then external where it happens outside of the kind of the IIIF flow, um, but the app needs to know if it was successful or not. And all of these use cases support degraded access. Um, so lower quality images um, for non-logged in people, maybe um, staff members or particular groups of people would log in and they'd be able to access the high quality version of the image. Um, and I'll show a couple of examples of these uh, and then I'll pause for questions again, just to give you a, a bit of warning. Um, so I mentioned the kind of order of presentation. So you start with the image and the presentation and then the search. And I think it'd be fair to say that authentication is probably the most complicated one um, to implement. Um, and quite rightly, because it's, it's important to get right for authentication. Um, there's quite a few pieces that you have to implement. Um, but there's a really good example of this working in practice in um, the welcome collection. Uh, this is an example of um, me trying to access something which you have to log in to view. Um, so I've gone through their catalog, I've found this material, I've clicked on it, and it says I need to log in to view this content. Um, another example from the uh, welcome collection is this one where um, for archival material that's less than 100 years old, um, you have to agree um, to abide by the personal uh, data protections um, before you view this content. And so it's popped up this, um, this terms of conditions and if I don't click accept, uh, it won't give me access to the material. 
Um, so there are two kind of in practice use cases uh, which show uh, how authentication works. So I'll pause again there. Um, I've covered uh, the IIIF search API. Um, to just the main points is that search within, just like a PDF search within, it's not search across. Uh, it only supports searching annotations only. Uh, and then I've covered the authentication API briefly um, and saying it's an interaction pattern for us, authorization rather than defining specifically how it's done. Um, with the authentication API, um, it relies heavily on, on cookies um, and the way that browsers are, are changing to protect user data, which is a good thing. Um, is causing problems with the authentication API. So we're just about to start up a new group uh, to look at creating a new version of authentication um, that should work going forward. Um, there are a few issues with Safari at the moment um, and potentially Chrome in the future. Uh, so the authentication API is actively being worked on to keep it up to date. And then we'll also bring it in line with um, IIIF version three. Um, and we'll also then look at the search API to bring that up to, to version three. So I'll pause there, there again for questions. Anyone want to, if you have a question, you can also raise a hand. No? Any question? Probably, yeah, too techy. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I, I finished, I'd say, I finished most of the, the techy stuff. Um, it's now going more onto the linked data side. Um, so I've covered the, the four main APIs um, and hopefully now this will kind of situate it more in the, the um, GCMI kind of structure of, of linked data and, and metadata. Okay. Almost finished the technical bit. <laughs> so. <laughs> One thing to say is that um, the IIIF is linked data uh, and the way it does this is um, through uh, something called JSON-LD, uh, which is, it's a really interesting standard uh, for making content available. Um, so in functionality, it's very much like XML um, or those sort of formats, um, but it has the advantage of both being JSON um, and linked data. Um, JSON stands for JavaScript object notation language. Um, and so it makes it really familiar and really useful to uh, web developers, particularly a lot of the, the developers that are developing these very JavaScript heavy viewers, um, like we saw earlier for navigating manifests. Um, it's very, very familiar to them and they don't even need to know that it's linked data in the background. Um, they're kind of much more focused on using it as a JSON object. Um, but it is linked data and I'll explain how you can turn it into proper linked data. Um, it's a really good way of keeping the spec honest um, and making sure that we, we fit into the linked data ecosystem. Um, but the vast majority of people I'd say um, don't treat IIIF as linked data, even though it is in the background. It's kind of trying to hit those, those two use cases of um, being easy to use, but then really relying on the linked data for its standards and to make sure that it is interoperable. Uh, it kind of underpins everything without being explicitly linked data. So this is an example of um, the info.json that I showed earlier. Um, and you can see we've got um, the ID, we've got the width, the height, uh, information about the tiles, uh, the sizes, and the profile. Uh, and the important thing for turning it into linked data is this at context. Uh, and we've got a link here to the IIIF website. And if you go to that, you'll see this at context file. And this at context file um, gives you the mapping to tell you if I start with this JSON field, how does that link to a, a linked data predicate? Um, and you can see uh, we've got the width here, which links then to the exif, uh, exif width here. It kind of gives you that mapping from JSON to linked data. And just look at that in more detail. Um, this is kind of a, a cut of that info.json, just showing the uh, first five uh, fields. So we've got the context.json, we've got the ID, which is the kind of source of any triple. Uh, we've got a protocol, we've got the width and the height. And then if we go along to the context.json, which again is a, a cut version, 
uh, we can see that the height links to exif height and it says it should be an integer and then the width is an exif width and the profile is a dope implements and so when we load that into a um a triple store uh, these are the triples which are spit out so you can see that this id here matches the at id uh, in json and then the uh, predicates match what was mapped into from the uh, context.json. And then we've got the, the values, which are the values from the JSON. So just by passing the, um, the JSON and the context um, to a JSON-LD processor, it will be able to give you back triples. Um, so that's how you go from IIIF JSON to RDF. If you want to go the other way, um, and I'm going to, it's quite a short section, so I'll pause after this. Um, it's called JSON LD framing. So if you start from triples and you want to get to JSON, um, this is the way you do it. There's a frame published on the IIIF website, and you can pass that to a JSON LD processor. And so the frame and the um, triples, it can then convert it back to a JSON LD. Um, and in theory, you should be able to do a round trip. So you should start with JSON convert it to RDF and then convert it back to JSON and you should get the same JSON. Um, it's not always 100%, um, but that's the, the idea. And so you can take any IIIF resource uh, and turn it into RDF if you want to. As I say, there are some people that do this, um, but generally people treat it as JSON. The kind of IIIF uh, and linked data um, really comes powerful in the next section. Uh, when I start talking about uh, annotations and also about structured metadata and how you can use that to find um, IIIF resources. So I'm going to pause here again, but if you want to find out more details about JSON-LD, there's a, there's a link there to the site. Any specific question? I think that both the annotation and the this JSON LD all W3C uh, recommendations now, right? It is, yeah, it is. And it's I think it's a really it's been a really useful decision to go with um JSON LD and to follow a lot of the W3 specs. It's kind of makes a lot of the pieces fit together quite nicely and be interoperable. Hmm. Okay. All right. So if you have question, you later you type and we keep the chat and you can maybe directly <laughs> connect it to Glenn and then ask. So. Sure. <laughs> okay, go ahead with others. Oh, did you see a question? Oh, thank you. That's just a chat there. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll move on to annotations. And um, personally, I, I think this is the most exciting part of IIIF. Um, and it shows really where the, the benefits of, of linked data and IIIF come to the fore. Um, annotations can come in many formats, and I've mentioned some of them previously. Um, so there's op optical character recognition. So if you've got printed material, you can send it through OCR processes, and it'll bring you back annotations of the text on that page. and Definitely more recently, we're seeing handwriting being um, recognized automatically by these systems, and that's, that's really exciting. There are also the kind of more manual processes, so transcriptions through Mirador. Uh, Mirador has annotation functionality. Um, in a lot of the uh, examples I'm giving, uh, it's using Mirador 2, but there's also uh, Mirador 3, 3, which has a very similar annotation functionality. Um, you also might generate your annotations through crowdsourcing systems. So you might uh, give people tasks to start annotating things. Uh, you might also do it through automated Im image analysis. So Google Vision or this Microsoft version, which will take an image and give you um, features of that image. Uh, if it's a picture of a person, uh, a place or, or things like that, they could be thought of as annotations. Uh, and you also might generate them through teaching tools, maybe as uh, giving students specific tasks to annotate or comment on uh, particular arts or work on manuscripts. Uh, and then the lecturer might be reviewing what they've annotated and see if they've understood the, um, the underlying material, especially useful at this particular time where a lot of remote teaching is, is happening. 
And so once you have these annotations, uh, they can be used for searching. So I've showed you the, um, the AAAF search API uh, as one example that when you've got all these annotations, you can make them available um, to users to, to use in a, in a viewer. Um, but you can also then publish them and make them available for more further analysis. So maybe as a basis for machine learning, uh, potentially just looking at statistics, um, particularly some of the crowdsourcing uh, projects um, produce some really interesting data. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Um, the first one I'm going to show you is, is something I developed when I was at the National Library of Wales. Um, there's an annotation server that's available there on GitHub um, and it's free for you to use. It works with Mirador and comes with Mirador um, so you can get going quite quickly. Um, it stores the IIIF annotations um, that Mirador creates and it also supports the IIIF search API. So as you're annotating, you can also search your results. Uh, and it also has an option to store the annotations in a triple store um, so you can then query them using linked data and it supports uh, Jenner and, and Sesame. Although I found through using it, it's actually more useful to store the annotations in something like Elasticsearch. Uh, and then once you want to do the processing, just extract them and then convert them to linked data uh, rather than and store them linked data at the time. It's just, I found it tends to be easier to work with. So the project I'm gonna talk about, I've, you've seen earlier is this, this Welsh Book of Remembrance. Um, this was a project in partnership with the Welsh Centre for Peace and was run during the centenary of the start of the World War I. Uh, the transcription process was done, um, was done with a community of volunteers uh, and the project traveled around Wales working with different groups. The transcription was seen partly as an act of remembrance and I know many of the volunteers found it a very moving process. Um, a lot of the names when you're transcribing it, they really hint at the stories uh, behind them um, and I'll show you some of them today. So what we did is we used a customized version of Mirador um, and the Simple Annotation Server. Um, and Mirador allows you to draw a box and um, just out of the box you get a place to type um, your annotation and also link some images and some audiovisual content. Uh, but we changed the dialogue so that you type what you see uh, and then you double click the words and you say if it's a rank, if it's a name, if it's a place, if it's a unit or if it's a ship. Uh, and also um, if there's a reference to a medal. And so we were able to both get the full text transcription, but also get the individual fields out uh, as separate data. Um, and as they were transcribing, we were able to link it to the annotation server to make uh, the transcriptions available. So even when they hadn't finished um, transcribing, um, you, they could still search the bits they'd done. Um, so you could put in the search box um, the surname Jones and click search and you see all of the different instances um, where Jones is mentioned in the data. And if you click on that for this example, it's kind of zoomed in to show you that's uh, William Jones uh, on this particular page. Uh, and I picked Jones, which I know is a very popular surname in Wales. So you can see it's covered all the way through the book. So for a, a previous presentation, um, looking at linked data in IIIF, um, I wanted to analyze the data um, that was collected um, so all of these um, annotation lists uh, have been published by the National Library of Wales and I'll include the link. I think I've forgotten to put it in the GitHub, but I'll, I'll add it. Um, but they are available for download if you want to take a copy of them and have a look at them. Um, and what I did is I took these annotation lists, um, loaded them into BlazeGraph, uh, which is a, a triple store, um, converted all of the annotations to linked data. Um, and if you look closely at the, um, the content of the annotation, Inside here, you've got um, HTML data uh, in a format called RDFA, which is another way of hiding linked data within HTML. Uh, and so we're able to convert um, each of these different fields to linked data items in BlazeGraph, um, which we're then able to query. Um, we queried the data using Sparkle. Um, we linked all of the places mentioned. Um, so you can see this says Abergavenny. Uh, and this is the place that they were most known from. Um, so it could have been the place where they were born or it could be um, where they grew up or it could be where they lived. Um, so we linked all these places to reference them uh, with Google. Um, for the Royal Navy and the, the, um, the Navy parts, we um, manually resolved the ships with Wikidata. So many of the ships had, um, had pages on Wikidata and we were able to link them to Wikidata. Uh, to try and find out what happened to the ships. 
And if we just look at the data, um, so this is looking at the places mentioned in the in the book um, uh, of where the people uh, who are mentioned in it, uh, where they were from. Um, and this this is uh, Wales, which is, is part of the UK. Um, and you can see the data kind of fits quite heavily with um, kind of the modern population data. So in Wales, uh, the vast majority of the population live in the south uh, east of Wales. And you can see there's a big uh, highlight of people mentioned in the book from there. And then the rest of the population is very kind of thinly spread around the coast. Uh, and you can see that this uh, kind of matches that. And you can also kind of see um, no area of Wales was really spared uh, during World War I. It was kind of very uh, widespread mentions in the books. And you can also see that there are other highlights. So in, in London, there's um, Welsh people might have migrated there, or it might have been English people serving in Welsh regiments that were mentioned. And also Liverpool, Manchester, there was also um, some higher spots there. So it's really interesting that you can take this kind of triple IF image um, manu manuscript, um, you can transcribe it, and then you can get this data, and then this data can be kind of really visualized um, to tell quite a different story about the source material. And then looking at the, the ships involved, um, so these are the links which were linked to um, Wikipedia, where the, the wiki data where there was a, a, a link possible. Um, and you can see, just looking at the, the number of lives lost per ship, that uh, the Battle of Jutland had a huge effect, um, and, and a lot of the ships were lost in that one. Um, one that really jumped out at me was this Carnegie. Um, which was a, a merchant ship uh, where 10 lives were unfortunately lost. Um, and doing some other Googling and having a look at some other content, um, I was able to find this story um, where it was a merchant ship that was um, transporting um, materials around the UK during the time. And unfortunately, it struck a mine off um, Scotland and uh, the ship went down, uh, all hands lost. Uh, and going to the National Library of Wales newspaper site, you can find the the relevant uh, story which links to the event uh, and also on various family history um, sites you can see a um, list of people that were um, on the ship when it went down and a, and a more detailed um, story of, of how it happened. This is another example of you know the stories which are hidden into this hidden in this book even though there are just a list of names uh, in the book you can really kind of dig down and find um, some really tragic and fascinating stories um, in the data. I just want to um, highlight this example, which we saw in the presentation yesterday, um, is a really another good example of um, the mix between linked data and annotations. Um, so I don't know if you saw this this presentation in, in the DCMI presentation yesterday. It's I watched the recording last night, um, and this is a great use case of um, images from different collections uh, of different characters um, have been analysed, um, have been annotated. And then they're able to create this really rich um, search service on top of it using linked data to be able to bring back the different versions and to be able to try and identify the um, people that wrote these different characters. Uh, and I think that's just a fantastic use of, of IIIF and, and linked data. Um, I mentioned crowdsourcing, and this is as another example of um, a way to generate annotations. Um, and this is another project from the National Library of Wales, again on um, there was a, I'm sure there's other people have heard this, but there was a lot of funding during the centenary of World War One. So um, you'll see, a, unfortunately, a lot of examples of, of that in, in my examples. Um, but this was uh, another crowdsourcing project looking at the um, digitizing and archival um, collection of tribunal records. And um, during the First World War, it was a conscription where people were forced into the armed services. Uh, and if you uh, didn't want to go, you could apply for an exemption. Um, and most of these um, archives have been uh, destroyed, but there, there happened to be one for um, the county Ceredigion in, in Wales. And so this was digitized and there was a, another crowdsourcing project to transcribe these records. Um, and it's a really incredibly rich um, kind of picture of, of the community at that time. Um, and this is a, a crowdsourcing tool which is open source and uh, it was done in partnership with Digirati in London. Um, it's called Madoc. Um, I'll make sure that the link is included in that. Um, but basically you can set up, uh, you can import your IIIF resources, set up the things you want to capture uh, and then you publish it and you get um, the public to transcribe it. 
uh, and this was an incredibly popular um, project again uh, for similar reasons to the last one about the hidden stories that are kind of buried in these archival records um, and so this this has been transcribed quite quickly uh, and again the National Library has made the data available as annotations uh, which can be converted into linked data um, and just analyzing um, the main reasons for people uh, giving I was only able to analyze uh, one of the parishes which is uh, not a huge amount of data but um, looking at what reasons people um, applied for um, for exemption to national service uh, and you can see at the start um, habitual workers of national interest and uh, hardship were the two highest ones the habitual work um, this is a very kind of rural farming area uh, where I live uh, and so a lot of the work would have been doing uh, producing um, food and farming um, for the war effort uh, and also a lot of hardship and there's some some real tragic stories in there about um, being the last son or daughter of um, of a family being sent off to war with ailing parents and then wanting to stay. Um, and so there's lots of really tragic and interesting stories in there. But once you've annotated the data uh, and made it available as linked data, it's possible to then um, build these kind of different ways of looking into the data. And then finally on this collection, um, I'm also just undertaking a, a fast AI course to try and learn some more about machine learning. Um, and within this collection, there are kind of seven different types of forms. Uh, and so this week's task was to build an image classifier uh, and using these annotations and, and links to images, um, it's relatively easy to build this image classifier, which given a, a picture of one of the forms, it will tell you which type of form it is. Uh, and I'm sure people will be able to think about much more interesting projects, but I'm afraid this is <laughs> what I came to. Um, but working with the AAAF and the annotations uh, was working really well. So I'm going to pause again. Um, so I've covered exciting possibilities for annotations. Um, I'm going to move on to um, AAAF and discovery, uh, and also which also has linked data collection connotations. Uh, and then I'm going to leave you with um, kind of further resources about where to learn uh, more about AAAF. So just pause for questions. Okay. I have one question from get on mute okay you can uh talk now nisha hi Lent. thank you for uh, the wonderful presentation this is really informative my question is uh, uh static publishing is getting much more popular and uh, many many institutions prefer to publish curation service statically than using a heavy server and infrastructure. So my question is, uh, triple IF implementation in, on the server side requires uh, more resources and uh, what are the challenges for adopting triple IF for static publishing? For example, if you consider CMSs like Jekyll or Hugo or Hooplus, things like that. So if implementers want to implement a minimal level of uh, triple IF, uh, um, content uh, for static publishing. What are the major challenges and what what can be done uh, to bring minimal triple IF image publishing or media publishing within these static uh, sites? And that's first question. And second is there, are there any uh, proposals or documentation for uh, some minimal recommendations for publishing uh, for static uh, publishers or triple F standards for static publishers. And uh, there is, if there are any resources, could you share some resources which implementers uh, can use? Sure, so it's a really, really good question. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't covered it at all in my presentation. Um, there are resources and um, I will, maybe at the end, I'll try and find a time to, to paste one into the chat. Um, luckily, um, it's kind of one of the foundation use cases was exactly this kind of low level and um, cheap and almost free hosting of IIIF images uh, using static publishing. Um, so it's always been possible uh, within IIIF. 
Um, with the IIIF image API, um, I talked only about servers, um, but there are different levels of um, image API implementation. It's from zero, one or two. Um, so most of the IIIF image servers are at level two, um, but there is also a level zero um, IIIF image implementation, um, which is uh, just for static images. So there's a way um, to generate um, IIIF compliant static images, which basically cuts out those tiles uh, and stores them on the file system um, so that it can be requested. Um, there is on the workshop that I uh, linked to, um, there is um, a tool to be able to generate these static images uh, on there and there's a guide about how to do it. Um, I've also written a blog post um, about how to do with this kind of level zero uh, IIIF images um, using Jekyll uh, and that's using GitHub pages and Jekyll to host a IIIF image. Um, so level zero is kind of the way you do it as this um, static publishing. Um, with the presentation uh, API, um, you're working with uh, a manifest, which is JSON LD, uh, and generally they don't have servers behind them. Uh, most people generate them and then store them somewhere where they're accessible. Um, so that's almost already um, static publishing uh, compatible. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sick. And there's a couple of questions about the recordings. Um, I found them yesterday on Eventbrite uh, and they were really good actually. Yeah. Uh, so Glenn, do you have any more? We've got about seven minutes. Sure. Uh, I've got a few more that I can uh, whiz through. I think we've got uh, not that many more slides. Shall I get going and then finish again for more questions if there are any? So you move on first. Yeah. Um, so one of the main activities uh, the IIIF community are now looking at um, is discovery. And it's really answering these questions. Um, how do you discover IIIF resources? How do you send content to aggregators like Europeana or DPLA? Um, and how do you keep them up to date to say that my manifest has changed? I should, I should let European or DPLA or other aggregators know that it's, um, it needs to be updated. And then how do you take manif one manifest from one viewer to another? Um, so there are already ways of uh, kind of dragging one viewer to another viewer um, using the, the IIIF badge, um, but it's not 100% standard uh, and it's not particularly accessible um, for uh, screen readers or anything. So we're looking at a different way to be able to move content from one viewer to another. Uh, and there's already a, a kind of a beta or even alpha standard called content state to look at moving content from one viewer to another. But for the aggregators looking at kind of sharing IIIF material from my institution with an aggregator like European or a DPLA, um, one of the, we've got this IIIF change notification specification uh, and that's almost ready for release. We're just waiting for uh, more experience with people implementing it. Um, and we've been working with Europeana, uh, OCLC have also done a, a prototype for this of kind of harvesting uh, people's data. The OCLC one is using the content DM. Um, so they expose from content DM these activity streams which are gathered together and they'll be able to create a search service on top um, to give access to this IIIF data. And then an example in Europeana. So Europeana already um, have IIIF content in their uh, collection. Uh, and I believe there's a Europeana EDM um, talk tomorrow and I, hopefully they'll kind of cover how they've linked IIIF into EDM. But in EDM, it's possible to link from EDM metadata to IIIF. Uh, and it'd be great to see that in, in other formats as well, a kind of more standard mechanism of linking uh, between different metadata formats and IIIF and then IIIF out to these formats. Um, but it's possible at the moment to harvest uh, content and see it available in IIIF. Another really interesting way of thinking about discovery is um, IIIF and Wikidata. Um, I think it was last year, but we had a, uh, a new property, um, P6108, um, which is a IIIF manifest property. Uh, and this is a way of linking um, any material in Wikidata um, to a IIIF manifest. 
Um, and this one can be incredibly powerful and kind of gives you the wealth of data that's in Wikidata uh, available for querying. Uh, and then it returns a AAAF manifest um, that you may be able to put in a viewer. And so it gives you the com combination of all the rich, rich data in Wikidata with also being able to plug in AAAF viewers to show the results. Uh, and this is just a simple example of a query looking at all the different institutions that have provided um, AAAF manifests. And you can see the National Gallery of Art is, is enormous at the moment, but there are quite a few uh, different institutions in that list. Um, some have been added by users, some have been added by institutions. I know the National Library of Wales have put in a lot of um, links into Wikidata. I believe the National Gallery of Art has been, there was a project to kind of collect them. Uh, and they've made huge project, huge progress in, in collecting links from National Gallery of Artwork that may already be in Wikidata, but now has a, um, a IIIF manifest link. And then just the final two slides. Um, further resources, if, if you think this is interesting and like to hear more, uh, I definitely advise you to join the IIIF discuss list uh, and also the Slack channel. Um, there are fortnightly telephone calls for general community calls showing different aspects of implementation. Sometimes it's vendors, sometimes it's people implementing IIIF uh, just to share experience. Uh, sometimes it's just demonstrations of new cool tools that have been developed. Uh, and then we have specific interest groups. Um, so museums, manuscripts, newspapers, maps, uh, the 3D group as well, uh, which meet uh, some, some monthly, some quarterly uh, to kind of discuss how to implement IIIF in these different areas. And then we have um, technical groups looking at making future changes to the IIIF specification. So we have one on discovery, uh, which we're working on those change notification uh, specifications. And we also have one, one on maps. And the maps one is particularly exciting at the moment, um, looking how we'd um, how we georeference uh, IIIF resources and make that available so that viewers can make use of it. Um, so that's a really exciting group at the moment. Uh, further learning resources. Um, so I mentioned this online workshop. Uh, there's one next week, um, which has still got a few spaces on, and then we're going to try and do this monthly. So the next one should be towards the end of October. Um, all of the resources are available for free anyway on that link, and you're welcome to follow it yourself. Uh, there's a collection of videos and presentations, um, and the Slack channel will generally be open for, for support as well if you get into trouble. Um, there's a IIIF guide from Tom Crane, um, which is a really nice introduction to IIIF, and I've used many of the um, examples in this presentation. Uh, there's also a two-day workshop from Jason Ronaldo, um, and also the list of IIIF compatible software and projects uh, available on the awesome GitHub. And then finally, hopefully I've, sh I've showed you lots of use cases for IIIF um, and how they can work and what people have been doing with it. Um, hopefully I've given you enough in information to get started with the image and presentation API um, but there is those those workshops if you want more detailed information I've shown you what the, the search and the authentication API uh, and hopefully demonstrated uh, the possibilities with annotation so I think we're almost at time um, but if you do have any further questions uh, feel free to email me or contact me on Twitter thank you so much and um, for everyone, if you have more questions, you can yeah, send here. Good. If you go to the Tripwide homepage, you will see all kind of demonstrations in the four uh, APIs all listed in details, as well as the community. Right. Any other question? Everyone knows to go to the Trivaev homepage. Yeah. Okay, we kind of like a, just a perfect timing <laughs> just <laughs> this uh, tutorial and uh, lots of details you can find from the Trivaev web page as well as the um, this presentation page that showed on the GitHub, including all these links, uh, great examples, just so many things to learn. Right, I guess we get a lot of thanks to you, Anglin, and this is so wonderful. Tomorrow, 
probably just today we will have the videos shared, start sharing um, and go on with the more implementations. Learn from your presentation. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>